What is up most distinguished patrons of this channel? So for today's video, we are going to dive into how thick of metal can you weld with the TIG process? So with that said, let's get into it. If you're no stranger to the channel, then you would know that I've done a couple videos in the last month, month and a half, dealing with maximum thickness. Basically, a welding process is taken, tested, and then a determination is made on how thick of material you can weld with that. Previously, I've done short circuit MIG and cell shielded flux core. Right here is cell shielded flux core. And we kind of made a determination, or at least I did, that both short circuit MIG and cell shielded flux core, generally speaking to get acceptable results, quarter inch plate is about the upper limit, maybe 5 16 but when you're dealing with 3 8 plate like I have here as well as in front of me, uh, you tend to have either lack of fusion issues in the case of short circuit MIG or internal weld porosity issues with the self shielded flux core. Now with that said, I didn't anticipate some of the controversy that uh, found me in those videos where I had a number of comments where people kind of were like, well, this magic setting would have solved it or had you done this, it would have solved it. And the truth is, is that I look at it very simply. Can the process reliably weld thick steel, 3 8 and above, and not have issues with lack of fusion, porosity, or anything else that just pops up that's consistently there? And the truth is, is that short circuit MIG, the process itself, and self-shielded flux core with 035 and smaller wire are incapable of welding 3 8 plate or thicker with proper fusion. It just isn't going to happen with the short circuit MIG. And like I said, the porosity issue internal weld defect with self shielded is a given. Now with that said, the question came up, well, what about the TIG process? Is that capable of welding thicker steel, say three eighths or above? And the short answer is absolutely yes, it can. The TIG process does not suffer from lack of fusion or internal weld defects like porosity, like most of the other welding processes can. Not to say you couldn't have a lack of fusion or porosity, but generally you would see evidence of it while you're welding, or if you do a lot of things wrong, like lay wiring with TIG at too low of amperage, yes, you can get weld defects. But if you know what you're doing, the truth is, is the TIG process does not have the limitations for weld thickness or for plate thickness that you can weld like the wire processes generally do. And that's why in this video, we are going to do the same test that I did with the short circuit and self shielded flux core. We are going to weld 3 8 plate with a quarter inch backing bar with a quarter inch gap between the plates. They're going to be knife edge beveled and we're going to TIG weld it all the way out, all the way to cap, cut and etch it, look at it and talk about the results. So with that said, I'm going to get one of these plates set uh, tacked up and we're going to start welding. So I'm using a 165 amp TIG welder. I'm using scratch start for filler wire. I'm using 332 filler wire or 2.4 millimeter. Amperage is set at 130 amp. Here's the first root pass that went in really good, no real issues. I need to do some more strength tests and cut matches on TIG welds to kind of give an overview of what's going on with them in comparison to other processes. Believe it or not, the weld isn't really that much stronger than, say, MIG or stick as far as the actual destructive tests, aka tensile strength and Sharpie and all those tests. However, the ability to maintain 100% fusion on what you're welding, aka no lack of fusion, no porosity, basically just clean, perfect welds is where the strength and TIG comes from. It's not really the filler, it's just how that filler is put down. Now, as you can see, as I'm weaving this, I got to do a pretty funky torch angle, and that's because I had to switch to a number six collet body, and that was because I was putting so much heat into that TIG torch that it was starting to smoke, and to get this video done in any kind of reasonable amount of time by putting the heat further away from the torch, 
less heat will wind up in the torch. It worked okay, but I did this weld, I guess, faster than I probably would in a real world, aka less time to cool down between passes. You don't want to just keep slamming, you know, 20 passes deep without at least letting it cool down to maybe 150, 200 degrees. If you see the weld that you just put down is glowing like neon orange well away from where the weld pool was and it stays hot, that's a bad sign. Basically, you're going to end up having poor grain structure of that solidified metal and it's not going to be as strong as it could be. And by the way, you don't have to weave something like this. You could do just, I don't know, 40 stringer welds. It'll take forever, but it would work. So now that I have this plate set all welded out, I got a couple things that I'll share with you. One, this took an extraordinary amount of time. I'm not joking. I'm used to stick welding stuff like this, and I gotta say, it took forever and many, many passes in order to fully weld this out. Now, keep in mind, I decided to make a amperage adjustment and leave it at 130 amps and weld this thing all the way out at 130 amps. Had I used 180 or even 200 amps, I could have used a bigger filler wire and likely filled this out far faster with fewer passes. The reason that I used reduced amperage at 130 amps is twofold. One, to prove that you don't need amperage with the TIG process to get clean, properly penetrated welds. So that's a big thing. And the second reason I did that is to prove that a machine that's capable of 130 amps of TIG on 120 volt, aka just a wall outlet power, uh, such as a ESOB Rogue 200, 201, and many, many other TIG process welders that are out there that are capable of 130 amps on 120 volt, that they are capable of welding unlimited thickness, just multiple pass. So the results that you're gonna see today will mimic what you could with skill achieve on 120 volts with the correct welder or for anyone with a TIG machine on 240 volts. Now, before we go and take a look at the results, let's take a look at a little bit of the finished product here. Now, when I was welding this, I didn't see any evidence of a lack of fusion start to finish. I didn't really see any defects such as porosity bubbling out. It would be fairly common if you didn't clean well enough between passes to see little pin dots of porosity. I'm talking microscopically. Uh, small pin dots when you did a cut and etch on something like this simply because when you TIG weld over scale and you're trying to move somewhat fast and you're doing this many passes it's it could happen but uh, we won't know until I actually show you the cut and etch as to what we got in here but overall it welded pretty good it just took a lot of time uh, rough estimate I would say is six to seven times longer, maybe even ten times longer than I could have stick welded this out. Anyways, with that said, uh, let's take a look at the cut and the etch of it over here and see what we're dealing with. Considering that there's probably over ten passes in this, the weld is overall very clean and pretty much looks perfect. I'm kind of surprised at how much it bit into that backing strip. That's about a quarter of an inch or about six and a half, seven millimeter thick, and it almost bit halfway through that. That's more than I would have thought it would have. What appears to be a light colored area where the plate seam is on the right side of the weld, basically between the three eighths plate and the quarter inch plate where it's a little lighter, that's not a lack of fusion or a defect or anything. That's something that is either on the camera or maybe dust on it. In person, it was perfectly clean. I don't see any of the original bevel edge left. It broke down everything really well. Even the tack weld to hold the backing strip onto the plates on that right side looks really good. And remember, this is all at 130 amps, which is in the range of a higher end TIG welder as far as what it could do on 120 volt. That's pretty awesome. Arguably, TIG is probably the only process that could get results like this on 120 volts with most welders. So if you're on limited power but you want to weld thicker material, TIG is your way to go. So in conclusion, what did we learn today? Well, we learned simply that the TIG process produces excellent clean welds and realistically you can weld as thick of material as you desire. So this process, even at 130 amps, 
can produce clean material welds on two inch, three inch steel. There is no limit. Keep in mind, the thicker you go, the odds of getting a lack of fusion on it is going to go up. So you want to use the proper size rod and enough heat and move fairly slow. A lot of guys love to just crank on TIG, crank the amperage up and move fast. And they don't realize that it needs the proper amperage and it needs time for everything to fuse together. And the faster you go, the more likely you are to get a lack of fusion. But 130 amps at a reasonable pace, multiple pass, absolutely you can weld 3.8 steel or thicker. Now in comparison to the other welding processes out there, such as your flux core self-shielded and MIG, the TIG process does not have the thickness limitations of those, so basically you can weld unlimited thick material. And I know that might be controversial to some based on the comments that the previous videos got, but it is the truth. Again, like I said so many times in this video, you guys got to remember that this is unbelievably slow to weld thick steel and unless you have a 200 amp TIG machine and you're willing to run say eighth inch filler for fill passes you can expect to take say maybe a foot long weld and just take almost four or five hours to fully weld it out on 3 8 steel even worse on thicker steel or a longer weld so it's one of those things where TIG is great for a root pass, a hot pass, and then stick weld it all the way out or dual shield it all the way out. But it's not the greatest process to try and get any production done. And that's the great thing with TIG is that if you don't have a huge production volume, there's really no cleaner, better weld out there than it, uh, regardless of what you're welding. It's just, yes, it takes skill and a fairly expensive piece of equipment. But speaking of expense, a uh, three to $500 TIG welder, or even a stick welder with a scratch start setup, just a simple $100 TIG torch and an argon bottle, could have done this to the same result. So that's pretty awesome if you think about it. It's not really that expensive to get into TIG welding, at least on the front end, and you can get quality results with practice you know, keyword practice. This is not going to be something that's super easy for an average person, but the results of it, it doesn't really take that much practice to get decent results on thick plate. With that said, if you got any comments, questions, thoughts on this, feel free to leave them. Otherwise, until next time.